Hello, my name is Darren Holmes, and today in AC Electrical Circuits, we're going to be looking at lab number 8, Series Parallel RLC Circuits. So under objective, it says this exercise examines the voltage and current relationships in series parallel RLC networks. And often series parallel circuits may be analyzed along the lines of simpler series only or parallel only circuits. It says both Kirchhoff's current laws and Kirchhoff voltage laws may be applied to these circuits. And then we're going to draw some uh, plots using the time and uh, phasor domains. So looking at our reference sections, we're now going to be going into chapter 18 on AC circuit analysis with complex numbers, uh, series parallel AC circuits. And you may need to go back and review chapter 13 on inductance and inductive reactants and chapter 14 on capacitance and capacitive reactants. So under equipment, you can see we're going to use the Keysight EDUX1002G oscilloscope, and that has the built-in function generator. And our DMM is the Mastec MSM9803. We're not going to bother with the serial numbers because we're never going to come back and try and repeat this experiment with the same equipment. So they're hard to find, so I wouldn't bother putting them in. Now I've already gone ahead and measured my components to make sure I have the right ones. Uh, so my 1K ohm resistor is 995 ohms. My 10 millihenry inductor, labeled 103 is 22.3 ohms, that's the coil resistance, that's not the impedance, right? The uh, capacitor, the 10 nanofarad capacitor, also labeled 103, and it measured out at 13.45 nanofarads. So capacitors have a pretty big tolerance on them. And the 10 ohm resistor, the closest resistor I could find to 10 ohms, measured in at 10.8 ohms. So that's the one I'm going to use, and that's probably going to be a sensing resistor. So down the side of the page, I've given you the two resistors, the 1K and the 10K, and the uh, color codes for it, so you can easily find those in your parts kit. So in Shom's outline, they have a nice section on series parallel AC circuits. And figure 18-7 shows you a series parallel circuit, similar to what we're going to be working on today. So in Shom's outline, you can see they've given us a complete example of how to do the calculations for a series parallel circuit. Now, I just want to bring to your attention that we do have to convert from polar or phasor form into rectangular form and then back again. So you might want to review lab number two, phasors and vector review. We'll start the lab off in polar form then we have to convert to rectangular form to add a complex angle together. So we're going to end up calculating something with an angle and then we want to add another angle to it. So we have to change to uh, rectangular form. And then to see it back on the oscilloscope with a phase angle, we convert back to uh, polar form. So under procedure, step number one, we're going to be using the figure 8-1. So originally this lab had two circuits, so I've just shortened it to one. So we're going to have a 10 kilohertz sine wave at 10 volt peak to peak. So I've written that in. R1 is going to be 1K, L is 10 millihenries, and C is 10 nanofarads. So there's our 10 nanofarads, our 1K, our 10 millihenries. And we need to use that sensing resistor to get the phase angle of the current. So I've drawn that in for you, and that's going to be the 10 ohm resistor. So we need to determine the theoretical inductive and capacitive reactances, parallel branch reactants, and total circuit impedance, and record these results in Table 8.1. We're going to then use Ohm's law and the voltage divider rule to compute the capacitor and inductor resistor voltages along with the input current and record them in table 8.2. So when you're looking at this circuit, 
It's really no different from a DC circuit when you go to solve it. R is in, in parallel with L. So this parallel branch is then in series with this capacitor. So we're going to get an angle for the capacitor. We're going to get another angle for the resistor inductor in parallel. And then we're going to get another angle for our total current going through the circuit. So this point here will be voltage divider and we are going to be using current divider. So when we use the current divider each of these are going to have a different angle. So before I show you the page of calculations I just want to remind you that this is a series parallel circuit and all we're going to do is try and find the total impedance or the total resistance of the circuit. So the resistance caused by the capacitance is XC and it's going to be at an angle of minus 90 degrees and remember that's minus J 1 over 2 pi FC. The resistance generated by the inductor XL is at an angle of 90 degrees and that comes from J 2 pi FL. Now to start solving this particular circuit we need to know what R in parallel with L is and remember to calculate R parallel we can take the sum over the products where R1 times R2 over R1 plus R2 is equal to our parallel resistance. The only difference between a AC circuit and a DC circuit is now we have to account for these angles. So R actually has an angle of 0 degrees whereas XL has an angle of 90 degrees. So I'm now going to show you the calculations required to solve for this circuit. So the first step is to realize our component values. So R is 1k ohms, C is 10 nanofarads, L is 10 millihenries, V in is going to be 10 volts peak to peak, and our frequency is going to be 10 kilohertz. So our first formula is for XC, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi FC. So that's going to be equal to 1 over, and I've put brackets around the entire thing so if you're putting it in your calculator you don't end up with one half times pi okay so it's one over this entire amount here which is two times pi times 10k times 10 nanofarads and that's going to be equal to 1.592k ohms and remember, this is an angle of minus 90 degrees. Calculating XL is equal to 2 pi FL. So that's equal to 2 times 3.14 times 10K times 10 milli. And that's going to be equal to 628.319 at an angle of 90 degrees. Keep in mind our resistor value R is 1k ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. The next step is to find Z parallel. That's of R in parallel with XL. That's the resistor in parallel with the inductor. We're going to ignore the internal resistance or the DC resistance of the inductor in this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to take R times XL divided by R plus XL. So you have to remember that we need the polar form of R times XL. So we take 1K at an angle of 0 degrees times 628.319 at an angle of 90 degrees and that works out to 628.319K at an angle of 90 degrees. Then to add the bottom portion, we're going to do that in the rectangular form. So R plus XL in the rectangular form is 1K plus 628.319J. 
So that equals to 1K plus 628.319J ohms. The next thing we need to do is convert R plus XL back to the polar form in order to do the division. So the magnitude is equal to the square root of the real component squared plus the imaginary component squared. So that's equal to the square root of and in brackets to keep the two together underneath the square root sign 1k squared plus 628.319 squared and that's going to be equal to 1.181k. Then to find the phase angle it's arctan of the imaginary component over the real component. So on your calculator it's tan to the minus 1 bracket 628.319 divided by 1k close the bracket and that equals to 32.142 degrees. So our answer converting R plus XL to the polar form is 1.181k at an angle of 32.142 degrees. Then finally we can calculate Z for the parallel part of the circuit as being R times XL. So R times XL from up here is 628.319K at an angle of 90 degrees divided by R plus XL so R plus XL in the polar form is 1.181K at an angle of 32.142 degrees. And so that is equal to 532.023 ohms at an angle of 57.858 degrees. So moving on to calculate total impedance. So ZT is equal to XC plus R parallel. So that's equal to XC plus R in parallel with XL, which is equal to XC plus R times XL divided by R plus XL. So looking at our formula, ZT is equal to XC plus R parallel branch. When we're adding two phase angles together, it's easier to do it in the rectangular form. So our first step is going to be to convert XC to the rectangular form and that's just minus J XC. So that's minus J 1.592 K ohms. Then to convert the Z parallel branches we need to take Z parallel and multiply it by the cosine of the angle. So that's 532.023 times cos of 57.858 degrees and that works out to 283.047 so that's the real part of our expression and then we're going to convert for the imaginary part of the expression so we take 532.023 times the sine of 57.858 degrees and that happens to equal to 450.481. So putting it together, we have 283 plus 450J. Then to do the calculation for Z total is equal to XC plus Z parallel branch. So you have your minus J 1.592K ohms, which is XC, plus the 283, 0 0.047 plus the 450.481 J. So that ends up being equal to 283.047, the real part, minus J 1.142 K ohms. That's the imaginary part. So now we have to convert this back to the polar form. So the magnitude is equal to the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared and that is equal to 1.177k 
And then to get the angle, we take the arctan, or on your calculator, it'll be tan minus 1. And in brackets, remember, we need the minus sign from our z total. So that's minus 1.142k divided by 283.047, and that works out to minus 76.08 degrees. So in the polar form, z total is 1.177k ohms at an angle of minus 76.08 degrees. Now I just wanted to tell you that we had to convert back and forth from rectangular to polar form just to make it easier to do these calculations. But if you have the correct calculator, you can type this whole equation in and the calculator will do all the conversions and give you the correct answer. So using your calculator, the first thing you're going to want to do is put it in complex mode. So press mode and your down arrow key and then press 3 to put it in complex mode. You can see in my top corner here it's in rectangular form. So we're going to press second function and then you're looking for a little arrow with an R theta. So in my case it's second function 8 key. And now you can see my calculator says R theta. So now I can type in my entire equation. So XC is equal to 1.592. Now this is K, so I press exponent 3. And then I press my angle key to put in the phase angle of 9, 0. And then the plus minus sign to make it negative. To that I'm going to add. And in this case I want to add R times XL. So R is 1 exponent 3. And you can put in your angle of 0 degrees. We're going to multiply that by XL, which is 628.319. And that's at an angle of 90 degrees. Then we're going to divide it and we're going to divide it by R plus XL. So to keep the order of operations correct I'm going to put in a bracket and R is 1 exponent 3 and it's at an angle of 0 degrees plus I want XL which is 628.319 at an angle of 90 degrees. And then I close my bracket and I press equal. And you can see it gives me 1.176 times 10 to the exponent of 3. And then when I press second function, exp key, it tells me I have an angle of minus 76.074 degrees, which is what we calculated manually on our pre-lab calculations. Now to finish up our pre-lab calculations, we need to know what VLR is, or the voltage across the parallel branch. So we're just going to use voltage divider. So we just take Z parallel divided by Z total times the applied voltage. So in this case it's 532 at an angle of 57.8 degrees divided by 1.177K at an angle of minus 76.08 degrees times our 10 volts peak to peak divided by 2 root 2 to get back to RMS value. So that ends up being equal to 4.52 volts peak to peak divided by 2 root 2 at an angle of 133.938 degrees. VC is equal to XC over Z total times your applied voltage. 
So in this case, it's 1.592k at an angle of minus 90 degrees divided by 1.177k at an angle of minus 76.08 degrees times our applied voltage of 10 volts peak to peak divided by 2 root 2 and that equals 13.526 volts peak to peak divided by 2 root 2 at an angle of minus 13.92 degrees. Then finally to calculate I total it's equal to E total over Z total so that's equal to 10 volts peak to peak divided by 2 root 2 times 1.177k at an angle of minus 76.08 degrees. And that's equal to 8.496 milliamps peak to peak divided by 2 root 2 at an angle of 76.08 degrees. So in table 8.1 I've recorded my XC is 1.59k ohms, XL is 628 ohms, R in parallel with XL is 532 ohms at an angle of 57.9 degrees. My Z magnitude is 1.18k ohms and my Z total is minus 76.1 degrees. Now you've noticed I've rounded these numbers up because I'm not going to get that much accuracy when I do the physical lab. On table 8.2, I've recorded my VLR, which is the parallel branch voltage, as 4.52 volts peak to peak at an angle of plus 134 degrees. Again, rounding those numbers up. VC is 13.52 volts peak to peak at an angle of minus 13.9 degrees. And my total current or I in is 8.5 milliamps peak to peak and it's at an angle of plus 76.1 degrees. So under procedure, step number two, we're going to build the circuit of figure 8.1 using R is equal to 1K, L is 10 millihenries, and C is 10 nanofarads. We're going to set the function generator to a 10 kilohertz sine wave at 10 volt peak to peak. I just wanted to refer you back to figure 8.1. We have our function generator that's connected to our capacitor. Our capacitor is connected to the resistor and inductor in parallel. Our inductor and resistor parallel branches come back and join at our sensing resistor. So this is the 10 ohm sensing resistor for us to measure IT and that comes back to the common of the function generator. So going with a close-up of my circuit you can see the red lead is going to come in from the function generator and I'm also going to hook it up to channel 1 of my oscilloscope. It goes through this bus line to my capacitor which is labeled 103 because that's a 10 nanofarad capacitor. The other leg of the capacitor joins the 1k ohm resistor and the leg that goes to the inductor. On the other side of the inductor I have a jumper wire because if you spread the inductor legs too far apart they will break off the inductor. So at the bottom my inductor does join back to the 1k ohm resistor and also goes to the 10 ohm sensing resistor. The other side of the 10 ohm sensing resistor goes back to the common of the function generator. Right now I have a red lead from the oscilloscope channel 2 joining to the yellow lead here that's going across the 10 ohm sensing resistor. So under step 3 of the procedure we're going to place probe 1 across the generator and probe 2 across the current sensing resistor SR. We're going to measure the input current both magnitude and phase and record these in table 8.2. So I'm just going to remind you to set up your oscilloscope properly. 
Make sure you do a default setup. We want to do a factory default setup. Make sure channel 1 and channel 2, the probes are set to a ratio of 1 to 1. Put on your wave generator. And you want your waveform to be a sine wave, 10 kilohertz, 10 volts peak to peak, with no DC offset. Remember the yellow waveform is our applied voltage. Our green waveform is the voltage drop across our sensing resistor. So right now I have uh, channel 1 at 2 volts per division and channel 2 at 10 millivolts per division. So remember, you're trying to set this up so that you get the largest waveform on the screen as possible without it going off the screen. And you can see for channel 2 I'm getting approximately 82.4 millivolts dropped across the sensing resistor. So keep in mind this is the total current going through my circuit. So you may want to adjust your horizontal line just so that you get that particular waveform going through your zero crossing and you may want to reduce the sensitivity back to 20 millivolts per division when you're trying to sketch these things. Now keep in mind that when you do change the uh, sensitivity per division you also get a different change in your result across channel 2 peak to peak because now we're using a different scale. So as these measurement bars seem to dance around a little bit they're going to give you a different value so you can see at 20 millivolts we only get two digits and no decimal places yet when i go to 10 millivolts per division i get two digits and one decimal place so it's up to you how you take these readings i usually like to take the uh the most accurate reading possible, so I try to go for a decimal place when I take my readings. So on table 8.2, I've recorded I in experimental magnitude is 8.24 milliamps peak to peak. Remember we read it on the oscilloscope as 82.4 millivolts. Dividing that by the 10 ohm sensing resistor gives us 8.24 milliamps. And then when it comes time to measure the uh, phase difference or the time delay between the two waveforms, I like to increase my sensitivity as much as possible to get the lines going as vertical as possible so I can easily detect those zero crossing points. And you'll notice that my input current is uh, actually leading by 20 microseconds. So in table 8.2, I've recorded my experimental delay as 20 microseconds. And to get the phase angle, I've taken 20 microseconds divided by the period of 100 microseconds times 360 degrees, and that is equal to 72 degrees. So continuing on in step 3 of the procedure, we're going to remove the sensing resistor, SR, and place probe 2 across the parallel inductor resistor branch. Then we're going to use the math function. The capacitor voltage can be found by subtracting the voltage of probe 2 from that of probe 1. We're going to measure the parallel branch voltage and capacitor voltage for both magnitude and phase and record these in table 8.2. So back here on my circuit, I've removed that 10 ohm sensing resistor and moved my common wire over so it's making contact with the bottom of the 1K and the green wire that goes to the bottom of my inductor. My sensing line, which goes to channel 2 of the oscilloscope, is now placed at the top of the 1K ohm resistor where it meets the inductor and the capacitor. So now I'm looking at the voltage across the resistor inductor in parallel. So the oscilloscope uh, channel 1 is looking at uh, Vn 
Channel 2 is looking at VLR, which is the parallel component of our circuit, uh, L in parallel with R. You can see the voltage drop peak to peak is between 4.3 and 4.34. So I'm going to record this as 4.32 volts peak to peak. And to measure the phase angle between VLR and our input voltage, you can see I've increased the sensitivity for channel 1 to 500 millivolts and channel 2 to 200 millivolts. And my time per division is uh, now at 7 microseconds. So I'm getting a delta of 33.6 microseconds. So keep in mind, VLR is actually leading, so this is going to be a positive angle. So in table 8.2, for VLR, my experimental magnitude was 4.32 volts peak to peak. My experimental delay was 33.6 microseconds. Dividing the 33.6 microseconds divided by the period times 360 degrees works out to 121 degree phase angle. So in order to measure VC on the oscilloscope, we're going to put on the math function. The operator will be minus. Source 1 is channel 1. That's our total input voltage. Source 2 is channel 2. That's the voltage drop across uh, the LR portion of our circuit. We want our scales to be the same for each of our waveforms, so I've got mine at 2 volts per division. That way I can compare the waveforms to see if things are looking approximately right. Make sure your offset is at zero. Uh, when I change my range setting for channel 2, uh, obviously the number is going to appear a little differently down here. But what I need is the peak-to-peak -peak for my math function, because that gives me the voltage drop across my capacitor. So in this case, it's kind of jumping around a little bit, so I'm going to record it as 13.4 uh, volts peak-to-peak -peak dropped across my capacitor. Now, in order to measure the phase difference between the two waveforms, I've turned off channel 2 because I found it a little bit confusing. Now, one of the things that I usually do is increase the sensitivity for channel 1 and my other channel so that I get a more uh, vertical zero crossing line. So, I'm going to try it with channel 1. Now I'm at 1 volt per division, and you can see when I get to 500 millivolts, it distorts the waveform, that's the math function. So the best I can do for channel 1 is to go to 1 volt per division to try and get that uh, zero crossing as accurate as possible. For the math function, if we press in the math button, we see we have a separate scale for it. So if you select that separate scale and then use the entry knob, you can actually change it so that you can get a better defined vertical zero crossing. So you can do this with the math function, but you can't do it with the uh, channel one because then the uh, math function gets all screwed up. So the yellow trace is my input voltage. The pink trace is the voltage drop across my capacitor. And you can see the voltage drop across the capacitor is lagging my input voltage. And it's lagging by approximately 4.9 microseconds. So this is going to end up being a negative angle. So under table 8.2, for VC, I have filled in my experimental magnitude as 13.4 volts peak to peak. My delay was minus 4.9 microseconds. 
dividing that by the period of 100 microseconds times 360 degrees worked out to minus 18 degrees. So under procedure, step number four, we're to sketch the waveforms on oscilloscope plot 8.1. We're to display the voltage waveforms representing V in, V R in parallel with L, V C, and I in. And we're to use I in as your reference waveform. So once I've drawn I in, I can turn on channel 1 and I can draw V in. So I've drawn in my I in and I've labeled the wave as I in and I had my oscilloscope set to 50 millivolts per division. Now I've drawn my V in and labeled it V in and it was at 2 volts per division. So I've now removed the 10 ohm sensing resistor and I have channel 2 looking at the RL portion of my circuit. So this is the voltage drop across R and L in parallel. Now I haven't moved V in back to my zero crossing line because that's where I in is. So now if I draw this voltage VLR in relation to V in. And please note that I've changed my volts per division for channel 2 to 2 volts per division, so I should label that on my waveform. So I've now drawn in VRL at 2 volts per division. So I've now turned on the math function, the operator being minus, and I've set the scale to 2 volts per division. So this pink waveform is VC and the scale is 2 volts per division. To make it a little easier, I'm going to turn off channel 2. So now I can draw VC in relation to V in. So I've now sketched in VC, which is the largest of the waveforms. It'll probably look better if you use color pencils. So under procedure, step five, we're going to compute the deviations between the theoretical and experimental values of table 8.2 and record the results in the final columns of table 8.2. So I'm going to leave you to do that. Then it says, based on the experimental values, determine the experimental total Z and parallel branch Z values via Ohm's law. So ZT equals VN over IN and we're going to record those back in table 8.1 along with their deviations. So to find our experimental R in parallel with XL, we're going to take VLR and divide it by IN, so that's equal to 4.32 volts at an angle of 121 degrees, divided by 8.24 milli, remember that's times 10 to the minus 3, at an angle of 72 degrees and that works out to 524.3 at an angle of 49 degrees. So you can see that this is off a little bit from our theory and that's probably due to the internal resistance of uh, our inductor which was about 22 ohms. So calculating uh, Z total that will be equal to V in divided by I in. So that's equal to our 10 volts at an angle of 0 degrees divided by our current of 8.24 milliamps at an angle of 72 degrees. And that works out to 1.214K at an angle of minus 72 degrees. So it's close to our theory but off a little bit, probably due to the internal resistance of our inductor. I'm going to leave you to calculate percent deviation. So under procedure, step number six, we're to create a phaser plot showing VN, VLR, VC, and IN on plot 8.1. We're to use VN as our horizontal axes 
and remember to convert all your readings to RMS before plotting the phasers. So on plot 8.1, to draw my phaser diagram, I first had to convert V in to RMS, so that's 3.536 volts. VLR to RMS is 1.527 volts. VC in RMS is 4.738 volts. And I in in RMS is 2.913 milliamps. I've used V in as my zero line. Then I've drawn VC at minus 18 degrees. VLR at 121 degrees. And I in at 72 degrees. If you're wondering how I got these angles, I went out on the internet and printed a protractor so I could put it on my zero line and get all my angles that I needed to draw in my phasers. So the last page of the lab contains four questions for us to answer based on our results, calculations, and observations. And when you've completed your lab, Show it to your instructor so that they may initial it to indicate that it is complete.